Would you pray with me that justice be done? For the world is a dangerous place. Oppression is here and it's growing each day. And it's more than one person can face. Let's pray like a scripture that we be made whole, awakened to mercy and grace. Would you pray with me that justice be done? For the world is a dangerous place. Sing along, would you stand? Justice be done, for the world is a dangerous place. Oppression is here and it's growing each day, and it's more than one person can face. Let's stand like a scripture that we be made whole, awaken to mercy and grace. Would you stand? Justice be done, for the world is a dangerous place. Walk, sing us. Would you walk with me? That justice be done, for the world is a dangerous place. Oppression is here and it's growing each day, and it's more than one person can fail. God had a name, what would it be? And would you call it to his face? If you were faced with him and all his glory, what would you ask if you had just one question? believe 
in things like heaven and Jesus and the saints and all the prophets. Oh, yeah, yeah, God is great. Yeah, yeah, God is good. Yeah, 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 yeah. What if God was one of us? Just a slob like one of us. Just a stranger on Try to make his way Welcome to Friday Church. My name is Bill Campbell. And we're so glad that you have joined us. Things don't always go right as my glasses fall off, but that's okay. Friday Church is a time where we can come before God and be who it is we are. Whether we're having a hard day, whether we're having a celebration, we present ourselves as we are to God, and we're so glad that you're spending this time together with us. One of the things we want to do is remain connected, even if we're not together physically. You can send a message over Facebook, and we want to pray with you. Um, so please send those messages in, and uh, we'll continue now with our worship. You know, we often call Friday Church a service of scripture and song. One of the scriptures for this week, we're going to not even read the scripture because it is contained in its entirety in this next song. This is from 1 Kings 19, verses 9 through 14, and we'll do it as a song called A Whisper Passing By. So here we go. Not by the earthquake and the fire, not by the way that shatters soul, the answer to my heart's desire. To end this wandering alone, Lord, hear my prayer that I may know what I should do, where I should go. And then a whisper passing by calls me to step into the sun. Raise my cloak to shield my eyes. This is the hour my Lord has come. Lord, hear my prayer that I may know what I should do, where I should go. Why are you here, God? to kill me too.
God speaks to us through scripture, through song, and through each other. Did you hear those words? Declare the king, open the door, do what I ask. You know, there's some people who can only hear the word of God through you, and we are invited to share God's love. Hear now a reading from Psalm chapter 85, verses 8 through 13 from the message. It begins, I can't wait to hear what God will say. God's about to pronounce the people well. The holy people God loves so much, so they'll never again live like fools. See how close salvation is to those who fear God, our country's home base for glory. Love and truth meet in the street. Right living and whole living embrace and kiss. Truth spouts green from the ground. Right living pours down from the skies. Oh yes, God gives goodness and beauty. Our land responds with bounty and blessing. Right living strides out before God and clears a path for God's passage. story of Jacob and the story continues with Joseph who's 17 years old at the time Joseph is helping out his half brothers while herding the flocks Joseph brought his father's bad reports on them Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the child of his old age so Joseph made him an elaborately embroidered coat, a coat of many colors. When his brothers realized that their father loved him more than them, they grew to hate him. They wouldn't even speak to him. 
So Israel said to Joseph, go and see how your brothers and the fox are doing and bring me back a report. A man met him as he was wandering through the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? He said, I'm trying to find my brothers. Do you have any idea where they're grazing their flocks? The man said, they've left here, but I overheard him say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph took off, tracked his brothers down, and he found them in Dothan. They spotted him off in the distance. By the time he got to them, they had cooked up a plot to kill him. Brothers were saying, here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him and throw him into one of these old cisterns. We could say that a vicious animal ate him up. Then we'll see what his dreams amount to. Reuben, the oldest, heard the brothers talking and intervened to save Joseph. He said, we're not going to kill him. No murder in this family. Now go ahead, throw him in the cistern out here in the wild, but don't hurt him. Because Reuben planned to go back later, get him out, and take him back to his father. When Joseph reached his brothers, they ripped off that fancy coat, grabbed him, and threw him down into the cistern. Now the cistern was dry. There wasn't any water in it. <laughs> then they sat down to eat their supper. While they were eating, they looked up. They saw a caravan of Ishmaelites on their way from Gilead. Their camels were loaded down with spices and ointments and perfumes. They were going to sell them in Egypt. Judah, one of the brothers, said, Brothers, now what are we going to get out of killing our brother and concealing the evidence? Hey, let's set him, sell him. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let's not kill him. You know, after all, he's our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. His brothers pulled Joseph out of the cistern and sold him. Sold him for 20 pieces of silver. Those Ishmaelites took Joseph, took him with them down to Egypt. That's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Is it possible that it could be a joyous time when you realize that you're standing before God in the need of prayer? Most of the times it's not. But God and His Son Jesus give us that possibility by asking us to always find them in our hearts. When we come to God in prayer, the sincerity and the knowing of God and the comfort that we're about to find all about joy, isn't it? Sing it. It's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my father, not my mother, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. The preacher, the deacon, not the preacher, not the deacon, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not the preacher, not the deacon, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer.
God, you have witnessed the bitter envy and brutal vengeance of siblings, generation after generation. We want what our brother has. We long for our parents to love us more than they love our sister. Mm. When authorities play favorites, we conspire against each other, lured and enticed by our selfish desires. Forgive us when we waste our days giving in to temptation. Challenge us to champion our siblings' dreams. Mm. Teach us how to apologize. Amen. Shape us to live a life of forgiveness and mercy, redeemed by your steadfast love, which hatred can never destroy. Amen. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Words of assurance tonight come from James 1, 12 to 18, out of the message it reads. Anyone who meets a testing challenge head on and manages to stick it out is mighty fortunate. For such persons, loyally in love with God, the reward is life and more life. Don't let anyone under pressure to give in to evil say, God is trying to trip me up. God is impervious to evil and puts evil in no one's way. The temptation to give in to evil comes from us and only us. We have no one to blame but the leering, seducing flare up of our own lust. Lust gets pregnant and has a baby. Sin. Sin grows up to adulthood and becomes a real killer. So, my very dear friends, don't get thrown off course. Every desirable and beneficial gift comes out of heaven. The gifts are rivers of light cascading down from the Father of light. There is nothing deceitful in God, nothing two-faced, nothing fickle. Oh! 
Well, good evening. My name is Perry Dixon. I'm one of the ministers here at Highland, and it's a privilege to be with you all for Friday Church this evening. We're so glad that you are joining us uh, from wherever you are joining us. Uh, it is a privilege to be able to preach with you, and um, I do, though, before I begin with our scripture, want to let you know that this Sunday is a Sunday we would like you to join us as well. At 10 a.m., uh, we will have worship, and Dr. Lewis Brogdon is coming as a guest preacher. Dr. Brogdon is the chair of religious studies at Simmons College of Kentucky and teaches black church studies at the Baptist Seminary of Kentucky, and so we are excited to have Dr. Brogdon with us and hope that you will join us for worship on Sunday as well. Our scripture tonight comes from our lectionary. It is in the book of Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. So hear now these words. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, Jesus was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. Early in the morning, Jesus came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water, and he came toward Jesus. But when Peter noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's always important to remember that we receive this gospel text, both as good news story in of itself, and also part of the mysterious, wonderful tapestry of the scripture that surrounds it. So on a first reading, we see we have a story about fear and faith. Battered by wind and wave, the disciples cry out to Jesus, Jesus who has returned from the mountain to walk towards the boat where his followers cling for life. Jesus walks on water, and he calls Peter, and it is Peter who then starts walking on water himself until he is overcome by fear, and Jesus reaches out to grasp Peter's hand. Fear and faith. This first reading is what gets us started, but a glimpse at the broader story gives us an idea of what troubled the disciples so much. In the chapters prior, we find that John the Baptist, the prophet and cousin to Jesus, has been imprisoned by Herod. We remember, of course, that Jesus and John are inextricably tied in life and in work. It was John, after all, who baptized Jesus in the River Jordan. Herod imprisoned John the Baptist because John criticized Herod's affair with Herodias, who was his brother's wife. And then at the request of Herodias' daughter, who has earned Herod's favor by dancing for him, Herod acts on his wish for John to be dead and has him executed by beheading. This violent execution of John, prophet and cousin, surely devastated Jesus, who withdrew from his friends and found a place of solitude in his grief. But then he speaks to the crowds and we read the miracle of loaves and fishes. So. The disciples have seen Jesus devastated and self-isolating before immediately going back out to be with the people once more. They must have noticed that there was an impact their journey was having on this man from Nazareth. So many miracles and yet so much pain and grief along the way. After the loaves and fishes, Jesus withdraws again, and that is where our story arrives. 
So we might understand that the disciples are afraid because there are things to be afraid of. They have seen and heard so much. They know violence and rumors of violence. Whether they understand it in the moment or not, they are walking the long way back to Jerusalem and Golgotha. Every miracle and every moment of joy balanced by mystery and foreboding. And now they, f they find themselves in a small boat during a storm in the nighttime. We know what it is like to be afraid. We know not only rumors of violence, but blatant acts of violence. As Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and so many others have yet to receive justice, so many human beings, black human beings, murdered by police with qualified immunity, and there is no justice, still. As a pandemic destroys American lives, half the country refuses public health in service of a would-be authoritarian. Even as cases rise, so many regions send students and teachers back to school, straight into danger, because we have failed so far as a country again and again. Those in power make sure essential workers, those in our stores and gas stations and restaurants have to work and yet still will not receive a living wage or health care. The disciples were battered by wind and rain at night, and we know what that feels like. When we can't catch up on our bills, when we are drowning in debt, when we can't imagine a future because the past just won't let us go, when the present is beyond anything we might have imagined and we can't see a way forward, overcome with grief, and the remnants of grief for wounds not easily healed struck with a diagnosis, wondering how we will provide for ourselves or our family, battered again and again by that which violates our very humanity, illness and our own fragility, racist people and racist systems, homophobic people and homophobic systems, transphobic people and transphobic systems, misogynist people and misogynist systems, the destroyers are legion. The storms are legion. We know what it is like to feel as if the storm around us is all that there is. And in our scripture, as the disciples despair, Jesus walks on water and tells them not to be afraid. He calls out to Peter, who but for his own fear does the miraculous himself. So what can this mean for us? How can we hear this story through the dark nights of our country and the dark nights of our own souls? I do not think you should try to walk on water, not for a lack of faith on my part, I just don't want you to go out like that. But I'm also not talking so much about physical walking, which is in fact a privilege, I'm talking about spiritual progress, more so. I do want you to know that Jesus calls to us not to be afraid right in the midst of our own fear. And there is plenty to be afraid of. There is so much in life and in the world that harms us and hurts us, and it's painful. But we are not called to shame ourselves for our fear and our pain. God does not shame us for our fear and our pain. Jesus calls us out of that fear, out of that pain, and says, yes, I know that you are afraid, but do not be afraid. The moment we step out of our fear onto the water, we surpass all that seems possible. And yet, as soon as we give in to fear, we start sinking again. So what I find in this story is that it is an act of faith to reach out to someone else in the middle of this storm, which we are all experiencing. It's also an act of faith to welcome the hand that is reaching out to us. It is faith to acknowledge our fear and move forward anyway, even when the way seems shut. Now this is not a sermon about the long work of transformation and justice and reparation nor is it a sermon about dismantling systems and recovery in our own lives, though these are all part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. This is a sermon which I need to hear, and you might as well, 
about how Jesus calls to us in the midst of the storm in myriad ways, some we discern and many we only recognize sometime later. But even to answer, to make just a small bit of progress as if a new world is possible just because God is calling us to it, even and especially as the storm rages is an act of faith. So if you are really going through it right now, take it one day at a time where you can. Find small moments of grace and of gratitude. Allow them for yourself and for others. Take just a few steps. Experience and allow yourself some spiritual progress towards life abundant, however close or far it may seem. Know that you are not alone. Amen. Amen. This is a time in our service here at Friday Church that is one of the most important times because it is where we lift up the prayers of the people. These prayers have come from messages online and elsewhere so that we might hear the concerns of our community and lift them up to God together. So as I read these prayers out loud, know that you are invited to join me in a response. As I pray, Lord, I invite you to join me in saying, hear our prayer. So let us pray together. God, tonight we pray for our new deacons here at Highland as they begin their work very soon in this season. We pray for Bob in rehab with a broken hip. We pray for Dave, who has a form of leukemia. And we pray for John, who is in memory care at a long-term care facility. Lord, hear our prayers. God, we we pray for a neighbor named Les, who is in the end stages of dementia. We pray for those in recovery, and for those still out suffering in the madness. We pray for all people who have become lost during this crisis, that they might find God. It may be a struggle, and I am struggling, yet we will make it. Lord, hear our prayer. God, we pray tonight for family as they find a new home and job and schools now that they are back in the United States. We pray tonight for Mary Alice Birdwhistle as she begins her service at Highland Baptist Church this coming week. We pray for all who are joining us as visitors and all already among our church community, that they might be comforted, that they might find courage and rest and restoration wherever it is possible in this season of social distance. Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 